Exploration Films. Check us out on the web at explorationfilms.com. When I first began to move from being an evolutionist to being a creationist, and my dental students had challenged me, we began to look at the assumptions behind evolution, which I had never looked at before, uh, was never taught. Now, an assumption is a guess. It might be a good guess. It might be an educated guess, but it's still a guess. All right, so the first assumption behind evolution is that what they call spontaneous generation occurred. Now, all that is is when, when they say spontaneous generation in this context, all that means is somehow dead chemicals came to life. There was no life, and then all of a sudden, in some sort of primordial ooze, here comes something that's alive and is somehow able to reproduce itself. That's called spontaneous generation. Now, evolutionist Kirkett says that's an assumption. Now, why is that an assumption? Well, because they can't make it happen. With all of the sophisticated laboratory equipment we have today, with all of the, we have every kind of chemical you can think of. We have every kind of powerful computer. So on the campuses where I go, I'll say to the professors that are arguing against creation and for evolution, I'll say, okay, look, you've got those computers, you've got the laboratory equipment, you've got every chemical, mix them up, make it come to life. That's all you have to do. Because evolution assumes that that happened at one time in the past. All right, now, that's, that's, that's probably the first major assumption, that dead things can come to life. The second major assumption they make is, most of them make, there may be a few that don't think this way, but most of them say, that only ever happened once. So now you have the dead chemicals, somehow they come, they're, now they're alive, but it only happened once. Now why would they say, and why would they assume, which they do, and that's how Kirkett words it, their second big assumption is, hey, uh, it only happened once, life from dead chemicals. Now why would they say that? Well, because it is prob the probability of that happening is zero. I mean, just to get an amino acid to become a protein. Uh, what's, let's say a simple protein, 200 amino acids. That would be a very simple protein. The probability of uh, these amino acids, all left-handed, now keep in mind, if you throw in a right-handed one, you, you have to start all over again, all right? The probability of amino acids getting together, bonding together to become a simple protein is something like, one to the 140, 141st power. That's a minus 141st power, but uh, so we're not thinking in fractions. That would be a, a one with 141 zeros after it. Well, some people believe there's only one to the 80th power electrons in the whole universe. So there aren't even enough possible ways to mix things to come up with a simple protein. And then you would have to somehow get only the left-handed amino acids. All right, so that's one of the reasons they say, well, it only happened once. Now, that's where they get their tree of life, where they say, oh, look at this. We had this one little cell, and now here comes everything out of this one cell. Here's your plants over here and all your plants branching off, and over here's all your animals and your fish and all these kinds of things over here. But that's an assumption. But once they make those assumptions, then another assumption is that viruses, plants, and bacteria, and animals, they're all related. So, you know, you look at your plant, and you say, well, Uncle Harry, how are you doing here, you see, because they're all related. Uh, we all came from that first cell, but that's an assumption. Now, what they do in the textbook is they'll draw these pictures of life, and, and they'll have a horse, and they'll have a, a fern, and they'll have a coelacanth fish down here, and they'll have man way up here, and then some pine trees over here. But they hook them up with lines, but there's nothing on the lines. Well, why is there nothing on those lines? Well, because those are the missing links. There's nothing there because there's nothing there. But that gives you a picture in your head. Oh, you see, these things are all connected. They're all hooked up. But it's really, it's really a fraudulent thing to do because there's nothing on those lines because there's nothing there. So it's an assumption that there's things in here, in between, that hook them up. They aren't hooked up. All right, well then they say that uh, reptiles, birds, mammals, uh, amphibians, they're all related. The fish came out of the water, became the amphibians in the water and out of the water, became the reptiles, which became the birds and the mammals. That is an assumption. And that's what Dr. Kirkett says. That's a guess, because we don't know, because we can't make it happen. For instance, if evolution is true, 
Then if reptiles, let's say, became birds, that's what evolution taught me, reptiles first, then birds. So we have a reptile, cold-blooded, dense bones, that's going to evolve into a bird, warm-blooded, hollow bones. Now, is there any such thing as, let's say, a lukewarm-blooded, semi-dense boned creature that's in between rep reptile and bird? No, no. You either have a reptile or you have a bird. And some, well, what about Archaeopteryx? Oh no, the leading evolutionary thinkers now are telling us, no, that's a pure bird. That's a pure bird. As a matter of fact, they have birds now that they have found that are before the Archaeop Archaeopteryx. And so what is evolution then? Well, it's a faith system because it's based on assumptions that even today, the leading evolutionary thinkers of our day, they cannot hook up these vast distances between various types of creatures. Oh, well, you see, those are the transitional forms, which that now that's the new name for the missing link, you see. It doesn't sound as missing if we call it a transitional form. And so, well, those are the transitional forms. Now, we haven't found them yet, but we will. We will. Give us enough time. We will. Well, what they are finding with the time they have is, and especially now with things like molecular biology, where they can actually go in and look at the molecules. One quick example. Ramapithecus was supposed to be an, an ancestor of man. That was It was assumed to be our ancestor. And then you have Vincent Sarich out there at Berkeley, and, and he uh, does the molecular work, an evolutionist. And he, oh no, Ramapithecus is an ancestor of an orangutan. Well, it's still in some textbook as an ancestor of man. When it's been proven at the molecular level, it has nothing to do with man. So this whole idea of Big Bang macroevolution is based on a whole series of pure assumptions. And so evolution then, in my opinion, and I was an evolutionist for the first half of my life, it is a faith system. If we're talking Big Bang to molecules to life to man. Exploration Films, where curious truths and uncommon minds meet.